uh, the elbow trauma. We've got uh, three young uh, elbow surgeons uh, from uh, UK uh, who are within their uh, five years of uh, consulting career uh, talking to us about how do we deal with uh, the complex uh, problem with an elbow trauma and how do we optimize the outcome. Uh, we will also have uh, a question and answer session after individual talk uh, and also at the webinar. Uh, viewers who are watching live uh, this webinar can use the slido button uh, from the bottom of the screen and post your questions to uh, the panelists. Uh, we all, as a kind of you know, young orthopedic surgeons, always uh, found that managing elbow trauma has been a difficult issue, uh, especially when you are either trainee or any young consultant. And we always uh, struggle to find the right algorithm and how do we deal with them. Uh, so we've got uh, this pride of uh, young uh, elbow consultants giving us idea about how do, you, how do they manage the elbow trauma in their practice. So let me introduce our first speaker, uh, Matthew Ricks. Uh, Matthew is a good friend of mine. Uh, he's a consultant shoulder and elbow surgeon at uh, Wrightington Hospital. Uh, he's got a special interest in upper limb surgeries. Matthew has uh, completed uh, his uh, upper limb fellowship from Melbourne and Nice. Uh, he's been uh, kind of actively involved in research work over the uh, last so many years. Uh, and published so many papers. Uh, he's got special interest in uh, education and training and has been actively part of the Wrightington uh, Upper Limb course over the last few years. So Matthew is going to talk to us about how does he manage uh, the elbow dislocation in his practice. Over to you, Matthew. Uh, thanks very much. And thank you for the invite to uh, come and talk. Uh, especially with uh, Joy Deep, Sumed and Andy and uh, Ravi, that's brilliant, thank you. So I'm going to share a video, uh, I've had tech issues before, so hopefully this video will work, uh, any problems just let me know. Hello, my name is Matthew Ricks and I'm a consultant upper limb and elbow surgeon at Wrightington Hospital and I'm part of the elbow unit working with Andy Wright, Sumed Talwalker, uh, Adam Watts and in trail providing elbow care for the northwest of England. So I've been asked to cover elbow dislocations, which is a huge area to cover. Um, so I'm going to uh, brush over broadly the different areas and then focus down and cover a specific area in more detail. So what are we going to cover? We're going to cover elbow anatomy and the contributing factors to elbow stability. We're going to go through types of dislocations, then focus down on acute fracture dislocations and go through two cases um, to discuss. So what is special about the elbow? The elbow, as we know, is a hinge joint. You have the ulnar humeral articulation and you have a pivot joint with the radial humeral articulation. It includes the ulnar humeral, radial capitella and proximal radial ulnar joints. And we know that it acts as a lever arm when positioning the hand and is vital in bearing weight through the arm and with function of the arm as well. You have a coronoid fossa that accommodates the uh, coronoid tip in deep flexion and posteriorly you have the olecranon fossa that accommodates the olecranon tip in full extension. You have both static stabilized and dynamic stabilizers. You have primary stabilizers, the elbow joint, which are your only humeral joint, your medial and lateral collateral ligament complexes, and your secondary stabilizers, like your radio capitella joint, which is a constraint to valgus stress. And the radial head provides 30% of the valgus stability. And the most important between zero to 30 degrees is shown in the literature. And the origins of the flexor and extensor tendons as well contribute as secondary stabilizing elements to the elbow. You have dynamic stabilizers, which are the muscles across the elbow joint, like ancaneus, brachialis, triceps, and biceps. And these are important because they provide a compressive stability to the joint. And when moving as a hinge or as a pivot, it's important to have this compressive element to allow uh, you to have the function and stability uh, to the elbow joint. The medial and collateral ligament complexes you need to know, and the lateral collateral ligaments, as we know, made up, is made up of the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, 
which is a primary stabilizer to various external rotation, the radial collateral ligament, the anterior bundle, the accessory lateral collateral ligament, and then the annular ligament. The medial collateral ligament is made up of three bundles, the anterior bundle, posterior bundle, and the transverse fibers. And it's important to understand the anatomy for this, not only for your approach, but also for your repair and stabilization of the elbow joint. So there are types of elbow dislocations. So I break these up into acute fracture dislocations, chronic fracture dislocations, and simple dislocations. So simple dislocations is misleading because simple makes it sound like it's a simple injury to the elbow and they'll get over it very quickly and it's very simple to manage. And that's not the case at all. Simple dislocations are ones where they uh, have no fracture or bony elements and it's a soft tissue element. So acute fracture dislocations are fracture patterns that depend on multiple factors. So the position of the arm during the fall or the mechanism is very important for energy transfer around the elbow and the, the structures that are injured around the elbow. The quality of bone also will contribute to the fracture that's sustained um, and the severity of the fracture. So energy and the quality of bone is a key fracture, which is why you tend to see two types of patient groups. One is your young patient with high energy um, or your uh, older patient with low energy from standing height. Chronic dislocations can be difficult to manage. You can have malunited fractures, you can have contractual problems, and you can have greater problems of stiffness and decreased range of movement. This patient here came to me six months down the line from a chronic dislocation and has significant amounts of heterotrophic ossification around the back of the humerus going towards the joint with limited range of movement. So your chronic dislocations can be very difficult to manage and need to be thoroughly investigated as well. Simple dislocations, as I said already, aren't simple dislocations. Although there's no bony injury and it's a pure soft tissue injury, there are varying grades of the injury. You can have potential ligamentous injuries, both the medial and lateral sides, and potential flexor and extensor origin injuries. I know uh, Andy's going to cover the MRI findings of these later on in more detail. So we're going to focus down today on the acute fracture dislocations that we get and how to manage uh, a few of those. So we've got a case of a uh, patient who fell off a bike and dislocated the left elbow. Their right hand dominant, no past medical history, fit and well with a closed neovascularly intact injury. So this, this x-ray shows that we've got, on the AP you can see, you've got a narrowing of your medial joint lines, number one, that you can see of your own humeral articulation, quite subtle. You can see that you've got the radial head fracture on the AP. And when you're coming to look at the lateral for x-ray, you can see that you've got a radial head fracture that not only is comminuted, as you can see, multiple fragments, but the main chunk of the head is sitting posteriorly to the capitellum. You can also see a very subtle coronoid fracture. And then when we got on to the CT, we were able to identify that the coronoid fracture was actually an intramedial and anterolateral facet fracture. And then there was a degree of comminution to the radial head that we were uh, concerned about being able to fix and would maybe need to uh, uh, replace. <clears throat> and the patient itself was mid fifties as well. So we were concerned about the quality of bone. So multiple factors that you're able to identify before you even go into the operation. Now, a couple of the points that we needed to identify to allow us to plan our approach is I'm concerned of an anteromedial and anterolateral facet fracture. I'm concerned of a comminuted radial head fracture. And I'm concerned of a ligamentous injury to the elbow. So it's important you identify these before to hopefully allow you to aid in your approach. So coronoid fractures, our knowledge of the coronoid fractures, the contribution to stability has, has changed over the years. Initially, we had the Regan and Mori classification, which was a great classification to use, which had the tip then broken up into less than 50%, greater than 50% of height, but didn't take into consideration the subtleties of the uh, anatomy of the coronoid and the stabilizing elements of the coronoid. The coronoid itself is an important structure when looking at the uh, and the stability of the elbow joint. It acts as anterior buttress um, of the electron on the elbow, a primary resistor of elbow dislocation, and the coronoid tip has a capsule insertion onto it. And the coronoid itself has an anteromedial and anterolateral facet. <clears throat> 
This understanding of the coronoid allowed certain classifications to be developed, and this is a great one from the Mayo Clinic, from O'Driscoll's team, which showed the different anatomy. It wasn't just a contribution. Uh, it wasn't just a percentage to the Regan and Mori classification, that there was a specific anatomy to the coronoid that contributes to stability. They've broken up the coronoid into different areas. This allowed the development of the Wrightington classification. And so it looks uh, into the uh, elements of the uh, coronoid, particularly anteromedial, anterolateral, and associated um, stabilizing elements to the elbow. So this was a Wrightington classification that's developed by the unit and the team up at Wrightington. Um, and it's a way of identifying fractures and dislocations around the elbow and giving you a sound management plan to it. So the classification is broken up into A, B, C, and D. The A fractures stands for the antromedial fractures. And so these are ones where your radial head is intact, but your lateral collateral ligament is gone. Your antralateral facet is intact. However, your antromedial facet has gone. So you need to fix the lateral collateral ligament complex. You need to fix the coronoid and then assess the stability on the table, whether you need to fix the medial collateral ligament or the posterior band. Then the bifacet basal fractures are your Bs. So these are broken up into uh, Bs and B pluses. So your B is where you've got an intact radial head and it's both an antromedial and antralateral facet fracture. And so you need to fix the coronoid, fix the lateral collateral ligament complex. And then your B pluses is where you've got an antromedial and antralateral facet fracture, as well as a radial head fracture. Your Cs are your combined comminuted fractures. So you've got an antralateral fracture, uh, but you've got a radial head fracture as well. But you've got a stabilizing element from the antromedial aspect of the facet of the coronoid and your DZ or diaphyseal fractures which can have associated radial head fractures. So coming back to our case we've got the fractures that have been identified the radial head fracture the bifacet coronoid fracture and then the concerns of the lateral of the ligament injuries as well. So this fits into our classification as a B plus we've got antromedial antralateral facet fracture so a bifacet fracture radial head fracture and concern of a lateral collateral ligament injury and concern of a medial collateral ligament injury. So the plan is to fix the coronoid uh, fix or replace the radial head and fix the lateral collateral ligament and then assess for stability. There's lots of different approaches to the elbow that you can do and there's a fantastic paper by Greg Bain that goes through all of them but as an elbow surgeon I tend to use a handful of approaches that allows me to get Get a, a good uh, visualization of what I'm planning to look for. So how would I approach this fracture? So I do it with a combined approach with a modified cocker, postlateral approach and the medial Hotchkiss approach. So although that the radial head is broken and in some situations you can use your lateral window, your modified cocker approach to gain access to the coronoid. But in this situation, due to the comminuted fracture to the coronoid, I was concerned that I would have to apply a buttress plate to it and therefore I was planning to do both a, a combined approach, a lateral and a medial approach. The lateral approach we know very well. In this situation, I went through ECU and Ancaneus. A tip is to mark the longitudinal axis from the lateral epicondyle and then uh, measure up 45 degrees and then try and do an angle of 30 degrees, which will allow you hopefully to come down on fast to the interval between ECU and Ancaneus. Um, the modified cocker approach. And so what we've modified, or it's been modified uh, by Greg Bain, was coming down the anterior aspect of the humerus. And what we're trying to do is preserve this anterior bundle. So we come down to the anterior aspect, waiting to the curving portion of the uh, capitellum. And then we're identifying the anterior bundle, coming along it to preserve the anterior bundle, and then coming down the um, annular ligament to try and preserve rather than cutting all the way through um, we're trying to preserve as much of that uh, lateral collateral ligament complex as we can so you get a great exposure which we know to the radial head you have to be aware of extending distally because of the posterior interosseous nerve running around the radial neck um, we then after addressing the radial head, which was unreconstructable we did a radial head replacement we saw the comminuted um, cat, uh, a coronoid element 
um, and then we uh, planned to continue by doing a medial approach. So I did the radial head replacement, I did the lateral collateral ligament repair, and then went round for the medial approach to fix the uh, coronoid. So a big tip when you're doing your Hotchkiss approach is stay on bone. So you identify the medial supercond uh, supercondylar ridge of the humerus and then stay on bone. You're peeling off brachialis subperiosteally off the humerus and the capsule. And if you're on bone, then you're safe. And then you can extend the interval if you need between FCU and FCR or PL and you get down to the capsule, uh, capsule and you get a fantastic view of the coronoid um, down to the elbow. And in this situation, it allowed me to place a, uh, a buttress plate. And they have some specific coronoid plates out there, which allowed me to sit on the coronoid to hold those fragments in place. We did a radial head replacement and then we did a lateral collateral ligament reconstruction. Now back to our writing classification, we then assess the stability of the elbow. And in this situation, it was stable through a full range of movement and no cast afterwards, and we were able to mobilize the elbow afterwards. So this is another case. So the, the um, patient fell from standing height, right hand dominant, closed neurovascular intact and fit and well. Now you can see from the uh, radial head point of view that you've got a radial head uh, possibly a radial neck fracture with a degree of comminution there. So coming to our Wrightington classification, this falls uh, within the C remit. So we've got a radial head fracture. Looking through the CT scan, which sadly I was unable to load up at this point, so I apologize for that. We've got antralateral facet fracture. It does show that the antromedial fracture is intact. We've got no change in the joint space medially. We've got a CT scan that shows intact uh, antromedial facet but the comminution to the radial head was difficult. And so that made this uh, very difficult and challenging to reconstruct. And so a replacement was required. So how do I approach this fracture? As we've already covered, did the posterolateral approach modified cocker, went down to the uh, radial capitella joint, assessed. Ideally, I try and fix, although I've given you two examples of replacement, I do try and fix these fractures if I can to try and preserve native bone. But in some situations, they're so comminuted that a radial head replacement uh, is better and gets them a better function earlier. So during my approach to this scenario, we found that the uh, lateral collateral ligaments revulsed. So you go through anchoring the SECU and you're straight down to bone. <clears throat> I have found that there was unreconstructable radial head, and so we did a radial head replacement and a lateral ligament reconstruction through drill holes and non absorbable suture material. Screening the elbow, we noted through a full range of movement that it was stable, so we only, to, only needed to address the lateral uh, components. So in summary to this talk, there's many contribu contributing elements to elbow stability. You need to assess accurately the fracture configuration. You need to appreciate what fractures there are around the elbow. And you need to appreciate the coronoid fracture, identifying it's not just a tip uh, coronoid fracture. There's either an antromedial or antralateral facet element to it. And then assessing the ligament stability in the table. And the aim of all of the elbow surgery, hopefully, is to provide a stable elbow, no casting, because if you're requiring casting to provide stability, then you haven't fully assessed the elbow. And then early mobilizing that elbow to try and decrease that stiffness and that range of movement. Um, thank you very much. Hopefully that's covered a small area of elbow dislocations. Um, it's obviously a big subject area. Um, and thank you for the invite to come and discuss it. So Matt, uh, thank you very much uh, for such a succinct talk. Uh, I know you, you've kind of simplified uh, the, the complex uh, topic uh, very well. And I think you know, uh, the writing term classification does help to all of us uh, you know, to give a bit of uh, uh, insight how do we treat this injury. Now, Matt, uh, uh, just a quick question. Uh, how do you manage your simple elbow dislocation? What algorithm do you follow? Consider the patient has been referred to you from any, you know, your fracture clinic and uh, your kind of registrar has seen, okay, look, you know, there is no uh, fracture here. Uh, how do we go about this? That's a great question. And simple, simple dislocations, we said before in my lecture, is that they're not always simple. So although there's no bony element to it, there can be quite a significant disruption to the ligament and the, uh, the common flexor and common extensor origins. So commonly, it depends when these patients uh, present to me. So there's a huge variation. So I get the patients who tend to come quite acutely, who have been reduced in our emergency department and within quite a narrow window, usually one to two weeks. If these patients come to me, then I tend to get an MRI scan of their elbow to assess the extent of the injury and then grade them accordingly. And so what I'm looking for 
um, which I think Andy's going to cover later on, are certain elements of stabilising that we look for for the elbow. Um, obviously, they have to have an x-ray for when they come in, a pre and post reduction x-ray. And so what I'm looking for, if there's any associated bony injury, and then I'm also concerned of obviously the degree of, uh, of soft tissue injury. So I get an MRI scan with them. Now, if patients already come a couple of weeks, you know, four, five, six weeks down the line, it's very different. And so sometimes it's worth just mobilizing them straight away. But I think from uh, elbow dislocation point of view, I think it's important to assess the, the, uh, any associated bony injury and then get an MRI scan. Um, do Joy D. Bandy or Sumed, you do anything different for your simple elbow dislocations? So I think Joydeep's raised his hand. Joydeep, do you want to come in? Yeah, I was going to ask you, uh, Matt, thank you for your talk. I was going to ask um, what the role for non-operative management is in these fracture dislocations and how do you choose those patients safely? I think it's a great, a great question. So it all depends on the fracture configuration that we have. Um, and it's very difficult because some patients end up going down the non-operative route from comorbidities, age point of view, or when they present. And some of our tertiary referrals come a couple of weeks down the line. And so they declare themselves down the conservative route anyhow. But I think it's, it's difficult, isn't it? Because it all depends on the fracture configuration, stability of the elbow. Because the whole point of surgery is to try and provide a, a stable elbow to allow early mobilization and hopefully decrease that stiffness and and decrease range of movement. Yeah. Uh, Matt, if you were to look at um, um, some of our practices, particularly international practices, you know, they tend to be general orthopedic surgeons. Everyone does everything in terms of trauma. Um, so for the general orthopedic surgeon, the jobbing surgeon, what are the things they need to look for on, on x-rays or on history to say, perhaps, you know, maybe this is not for me. And I now need to refer this to a, a specialist upper limb unit or to one of my upper limb colleagues. Uh, and this is probably not going to be something that's going to do well. So when you have a look at the x-ray the first time, perhaps well, what, how can you guide some of our colleagues who are, you know, perhaps working in smaller towns and cities? Um, and they have the opportunity to obviously get patients to travel. But then instead of approaching the problem, six weeks later on when it's more difficult to sort out how can they pick this up immediately I, it's a very good point um as you know in the uk we've developed we're developing the uh, get it right first time model and um developing certain units in particular we've got our right into an elbow unit we've been developing and i think the key factor that the GERFT has identified is about volume of operating i know joy deep you've been involved with um setting up with the GERFT and everything but it's all about numbers experience and and the service of uh, care that you can deliver afterwards so if you're a unit that only does one elbow replacement a year then you won't have the same uh, experience or care package in place as a unit that's delivering a lot more. So I think for starters, if you're a, a surgeon who does not routinely perform these, uh, elbow, particularly if you've got a community radial head, if you've identified a coronary fracture, complex fracture dislocations of the elbow, and you're a low volume surgeon, or if you're in a subspecialty where you, you don't do these, um, or even if you're thinking twice about whether to do it, then you should err on the side of caution and send it to a unit or a surgeon that has a higher experience or more so a higher volume and the correct care package in place. And I think that's shaping elbow surgery in the UK very much so because it's all about developing these units that will hopefully provide the best care to these patients. Because historically, I think general uh, orthopods would have tackled most elbow fractures, particularly during my training they would have done. And I think uh, the outcomes can be improved by having specialist surgeons and specialist units that deliver it and uh, particularly arthroplasty as well because um you know the numbers of elbow replacements hemis which i know joy is going to cover total elbows and aren't a big number and so again it comes back to operative experience operative skill set and a surgeon who performs it regularly with the correct care package in place and a lot of these elbows require quite a bit of care afterwards expert physio expert elbow physio to get rid of that stiffness to make sure that they're being rehabbed correctly to try and get it and if you're in a, a dgh without that capabilities and i think it's uh, probably better to refer on but all simple dislocations no so <laughs> I wouldn't want them all referred to an expert center but if you've got uh, concerns of a fracture or a complex fracture and you feel that your skill set does not match it then find someone who does. Um, yeah I'd, um, I'd yeah. completely agree with what Matt said I think certainly that first case Matt talks about with that 
uh, coronoid fracture extending around medially, those are the ones that really need identifying early. So with a CT imaging, uh, and they often require a medial approach for, for fixing the coronoid to get that stability. I think that's one of the sort of key things that we've become more clear about over recent years. Um, with uh, the Adriscal classification and with the more advent of the, the greater use of CT scans. So those medial coronoid fractures are really the, the key ones you want to pick up. And if you're, if you're not confident or experienced those medial approaches, then perhaps those are the ones you want to uh, pass on to, to people. So that, uh, hopefully that's something I might cover a bit later on um, in my, my talk later. And even so, with so the Matt, is there any oh, kind of a role for uh, immobilization or a brace in non-operative treatment of simple dislocations, or what is your practice? So, so my so um, my approach to, to elbows is to try and create a stable elbow that allows early mobilization to decrease the stiffness and decrease range of movement that occurs. So whenever I, whenever we do surgery, our aim, the outcome from the surgery is to produce a stable elbow. So majority of situations, I will try and create a stable elbow. If you're relying on a cast or a, a bracing to provide stability, then um, you, you won't be able to get that early mobilization and stiffness. Um, but it is difficult because some patients declare themselves down the conservative route, whether it's time of, of presentation or whether it's um, whether it's patient factors. The majority of and patients. Do you, all are, your elbows get MR scan uh, because some of the units may not have that facility available to them, uh, Matt. So how would you kind of uh, you know work around that? Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a great point, and also the expense as well. So some yes, some units don't have that availability and so I think clinical assessment of the stability of the elbow but when you get an acute elbow dislocation at one week two weeks it's very difficult to assess uh, they're very sore swollen painful and so it's difficult to assess there. Joy what do you do with MRI scans in your unit for simple dislocations of the elbow? I work in a trauma center so we have a, a really high volume of elbow trauma and dislocations and um, so we don't routinely do MRIs. I think the 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 way I try and address it is we examine the patients and we use certain tests to look for instability. The key component that might tip these patients into an operative group are those with a lateral ligament and um, uh, common extensor origin tear. And we can quite reliably examine for this in clinic. And the, and the point is you can stabilize these elbows with a primary repair of the tendons and ligaments even two or three weeks later with good results. So I don't think we, you have to rush into an MRI uh, for all of them. And we, we don't actually know yet that MRI, MRI influences our surgical treatment enough and correlates with good or bad results. So we don't actually have that data yet. So, um, but I think the key message is whatever you do, you need to look for the lateral ligament in a simple elbow dislocation and the common extensor origin, whether that's through clinical examination or MRI or any UA in theatre. And those are the patients that may go on to have instability, um, so surgical candidates. So speaking so, to some of the... Uh, sorry, Ravi, can I just say something quickly? Yeah? Of course, yes, Amit, sorry. So um, speaking to some of the other bigger trauma centers like yours, Joydeep. Essentially, what they found is that a number of these elbows, they fall into this gray category. And you find increasingly that you take more and more to theater for a quick EUA because you can't assess them early. Let's say someone has a 20-foot fall and has a, a shoulder dislocate, elbow dislocation and is part of a multi-trauma sort of um, scenario. Then um, what they found is that the number of these EUAs that they've taken to theater increases. And that's always a very useful adjunct, isn't it? You just examine this, do all your tests, find out if it's very unstable, and then that really helps you decide on your treatment algorithm. Is that yeah. something you found if you're a, a level one it, trauma unit? Yeah, they're two completely different injuries, so you can't treat them as uh, the same. So you have one category is an isolated dislocation of, you know, someone who's fallen in the park standing high, and that's very different to a high energy polytrauma patient. So um, you have to be more suspicious in those patients, but the same principles really do apply. So you can still examine them. You can still look for um, uh, evidence of subluxation radiographically. And if you see subluxation in a cast, a sling or radiographically, then that elbow will need surgery. You don't need to do any UA. So the same principles apply, but your index of suspicion certainly goes up for those more industrial type dislocations, uh, if you want, for want of a better word.
So it's a completely different species, isn't it? If you have a slightly overweight man like me falling across on his elbow and dislocating his, his elbow, and then you've got this other group increasingly, you know, with faster cars and highways and expressways everywhere, um, you have a, a large number of cases that end up in, in hospital and you could be the one, the orthopedic surgeon managing them. So as Joydeep said, you've got to be able to, to, to differentiate between these two species of fractures. They're completely different beasts. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know, uh, we have our traditional teaching when we were training that we were following that circle of Hori that everything starts from front, goes laterally and comes up medially. And I think, you know, uh, listening to Adam Watt's talks uh, previously, you know, it, I think the writing study did show that there are uh, you you can find majority of the injuries on the medial side starting and you can get the lateral side intact. So it becomes a bit difficult sometimes just to rely on certain tests, isn't it? And the patients coming to clinic within a week or two, it's very difficult to examine them as well, George. And I don't know how you manage to examine them. Do you just kind of allow them to do a kind of a flexion extension in a supine position and see whether they can do it pain-free? And if they can manage that, then give them a kind of a benefit of doubt. So, so if a patient, let's just talk about the more simple group of simple dislocations. So that's what we're really talking about. So if they come to clinic at two weeks, which is about the norm for us, one to two weeks, and they're moving their elbow, they're happy with it, then aside from a plain x-ray, we don't get any uh, further imaging. I examine them. I do the posterolateral rotatory draw test which um, looks for the lateral collateral ligament insufficiency. If that's positive, then I talk to the patients about a stabilization procedure. If it's negative, they're going to always have bruising medially. They're always going to have an MCL injury. So you, we're not looking for that because it will always be there. Those patients that, can't, that are congruent when you take an x-ray, but and they have no fracture but they're very reluctant to examine we use you look for some other red flags so again bear in mind we're looking for a lateral sided injury if they have bruising on the lateral side that's a red flag you can usually coax these patients to examine them even fracture dislocations at two weeks with into doing a posterior lateral draw test and if you if any of those tests are positive or you're worried at that point, then you then you go to theater and do an EUA. And if you show, prove lateral sided instability, we go on to repair that side and, and, and then go through the surgical algorithm. So for me, MRI is useful at times, but in select, in select patients where I'm wondering about the diagnosis of a lateral sided injury, but I can't quite make it. So that in that way, you can distill and not MRI every person. So uh, the question to Matthew, Matthew, what is your preferred method of fixation of coronoid? I find it sometimes difficult to choose what should be my method of fixing this, uh, depending on type of the fracture anyway, but uh, what is your preferred method? So it depends on the size, the chunk, the degree of comminution. There's quite a few factors you need to take in consideration. Um, when it comes to a very large chunk, I tend to get compression with a point of production clamp across it, and then you can get a screw that fixes into it. Um, if there's a degree of comminution and I need some buttressing, then a buttress plate works very well. In severe comminution where you've got a deficiency there, then sometimes I harvest the radial head and use that as a, a block underneath the plate to help stabilize it. And in some situations, the radial head's destroyed so much, you can consider a allograft. Um, but it really depends on the degree of comminution, the number of fragments, and the quality of bone. Um, all you're looking for is to try and create a bony block at the front, a degree of stability there. And so it does vary. But um, as Andy said, the medial approach, even performed by elbow surgeons, isn't, isn't done that many times throughout the year, a handful of times. Uh, the the posterolateral is a lot more commonly performed. And so coronoid ones, I think the majority I end up screwing and probably a handful I end up plating. And then very rarely, one twice a year, do I need to do a uh, allograft or radial head block. Andy, Joydi, what do you find? Yeah, I'll just make one point. Um, we, and some, many people talk about using sutures for fixing these coronoids for very small fragments. I can tell you that in over 120 fracture dislocations, we've never needed to use sutures. And again, the point is, the time you might consider using sutures is in very small coronoid fractures. And in those fractures, they don't need fixing. So you don't, you never have to use sutures to try and grab the capsule or drill through those coronoids. 
I, I would say, as um, Matt just said, if you're going to fix the coronoid, fix it rigidly, stably, and um, you'll be much better off. And, and so I think the trend, I would say, is to go away from this suture concept that has been traditionalized in the past. And it wasn't just it's small, great, think, yeah. small chunks. Think, yeah. I've seen people do drill holes and pass sutures anteriorly with quite large chunks, and you won't get the compressive element there, will you? The, the, in the past, you know, when people didn't have access to some of this kit, one of the things that people used to use is um, the, the K wires, which had, uh, um, yeah. you know, the, the screw, screw type end, like at the Ashney wires. So those used to provide a degree of compression, but, you know, we, there are better things available, but in, in, in their absence, you can use that. Yeah. Great, great. Like just mindful of time. Uh, so I think uh, we'll move on from elbow dislocation to another complex uh, talk uh, on uh, distal uh, humeral fractures and the role of arthroplasty. Uh, uh, let me introduce uh, Joydeep uh, for this talk. Uh, Joydeep uh, is a consultant, uh, upper limb surgeon, uh, specializes in shoulder and elbow work at uh, Brighton Hospital. Uh, as you all know, the Brighton is the better part of the UK with more sunshine. Uh, so Joydeep has been trained uh, at Southwest Thame Rotation. Uh, following his training, he's completed his fellowship at uh, Adelaide, New Zealand, and uh, of course at Brighton Hospital. He's got special interest in shoulder and elbow surgery and has done extensive work uh, with uh, Adam Watts on uh, elbow hemiarthroplasty. And he's got a good amount of experience in elbow replacement as well. So along with his clinical work, he's uh, quite heavily involved in uh, research work as well as training. So over to you, Joydeep. Thank you, Ravi, for the kind, uh, kind words and introductions. So, and thank you to Ortho TV for allowing me to uh, join this webinar. So I'm going to talk to you about elbow arthroplasty and its role in uh, distal humeral trauma. And, and as Ravi said, I'm a, I'm a primarily an elbow specialist and working in Brighton in the UK. So uh, just one disclosure is I do consulting with Wright Medical and you'll see some implants um, related to that here. So what we're gonna do in this talk is we're gonna revisit some of the early evidence uh, regarding elbow trauma in fractures, uh, sorry, elbow arthroplasty in fractures. We're going to see if we can refine our indications for um, which patients are suitable for these um, procedures. I'm going to touch on how to optimize technique to get good outcomes. And we'll, we'll also mention some of the unanswered questions that we need to investigate to know more about this subject. So these are two landmark papers that really shape much of our thinking these days about um, whether to use total elbow arthroplasty uh, over fixation in older patients, and in these studies over 65. The first is a, a small uh, non-randomized cohort study, and again, a non-randomized, um, sorry, an, a um, small randomized trial by McKee. But you'll note that both of these were performed in 2003 and 2009, so over 10 years ago. But both showed superior outcomes with total elbow over fixation, with fewer complications uh, in the total elbow group. Now let's consider this sort of case. So an 80-year-old with active female with this fracture, and you can see four major um, fragments, um, but there will be some comminution as well. And depending on the patient characteristics and the surgeon's characteristics, we have the option of non-operative treatment, internal fixation, hemiarthroplasty, and total elbow replacement. Now, this is a case actually from taken from the paper in McKee's study, and this is how it was fixed in the ORIF group. And I'd put it to you that if we were performing fixation like this now, uh, we wouldn't be happy with the way we've fixed this. And this goes back to my point that we're looking at studies from 2009 where fixation techniques and implants really aren't comparable to now. So I think it's, it may be unfair to compare, um, correlate some of the findings to our, to our, re our current practice. Because arthroplast uh, fixation of distal humerus fractures is extremely challenging. These are four cases I've done in the last uh, six months to a year. And you'll see that 
each case has a different different type of distal humeral fracture with different techniques, different implants, different approaches required. And traditionally, arthroplasty tends to be done by expert surgeons in expert centers, whereas fixation tends to be done by broader uh, group of surgeons who will have a go at fixing anything. And often these are not even shoulder and elbow or trauma specialists. So um, arthroplasty tends to be more rep reproducible and we have to be aware that we're not really fairly compar uh, comparing all these techniques, all these uh, factors. If we look at the results of total elbow for trauma, you know, this um, nice uh, meta-analysis, you can see that the short-term outcome studies show excellent uh, results for total elbow performed for trauma. But as we go to longer term studies, we start seeing more and more complications. And remember these complications, such as um, those requiring deep infection after total elbow or requiring major revision are real serious complications. And the message is that with time, if the patients live long enough that they will start developing complications that are difficult to overcome. Here's an example of a total elbow performed for a 66 year old man who is a manual laborer for, uh, for trauma. And there's a multitude of uh, problems with this that's led uh, and primarily in the decision making for doing a total elbow on this sort of patient. And it's led to a complication with loosening bone loss, possible infection. That's gonna be a life changing uh, complication and event for this patient. What about hemiarthroplasty? I performed a systematic review a few years back, and again, it is a few years old now. And, but at that time, there was only 121 uh, patients in the reported uh, literature who had had a hemiarthroplasty. And the complication rate was, 22, uh, was 18% and a higher reoperation rate. But just note that almost all of these were for metalwork removal, primarily related to an olecranon osteotomy fixation, which was the approach used um, by many surgeons at the time. If we look at the UK data from the National Joint Registry, it gives us information on the trends for what's happening in this country and can probably be extrapolated uh, worldwide. So we see that there's a year-on-year -year increase in, in elbow arthroplasty for trauma. We also see that in the last few years, hemiarthroplasty is uh, exponentially increasing and that the uh, number of arthroplasties performed for acute trauma and trauma-related problems such as non-union are increasing constantly, and that's projected to continue. So what are my possible acute indications for arthroplasty? So in acute fractures, you might consider it for these really comminuted multifragmentary fractures that involve the condyles and extend upwards the complex articular or coronal shear fractures where the condyles are spared, but the articular fragments are split into multiple small shallow fragments. And this is probably my biggest indication for elbow arthroplasty for trauma. And then you might consider it for these low transcondylar fractures that have poor bone stop for fixation distally. And we can extend the indications for trauma arthroplasty into these sort of cases. So failed fracture fixation with heterotopic ossification, non-unions in the older patients with osteoporotic bone, and even open fractures, which we've done arthroplasty for. So who's the ideal trauma patient? Well, they, in my opinion, they should be older. Um, they, the patient should require reliable elbow function, i.e. they are an active patient that wants to, needs to use that arm and function for independence or, or activities of daily living. They should be compliant and they should have a low risk of infection or low risk of periprosthetic fracture. So we're not looking at a patient with, who has multiple falls with dementia. Those patients may be more appropriate for non-operative management. If you decide to do an elbow arthroplasty, should we do a total or should we do a hemi? So with the total elbow, there's more robust evidence, as I've shown you. It's a long, it's a, it's a more, it's an older procedure, so there's more evidence regarding it. It's perhaps a definitive procedure, and it may give you more guaranteed pain relief because we've resurfaced both sides of the joint. And the patients may be easier to rehabilitate if you link these because the patient can just move straight away without any risk of instability. But we've now introduced complications that could happen to the ulnar component, the polyethylene bearing 
And if we have complications, then they're much more difficult and bigger to revise than if we do a hemiarthroplasty. So in the hemiarthroplasty, we don't have any ulnar or bearing related complications. It's an easier revision to do if you have to convert this to a total elbow. And it may be more suited to trauma because the patient's uh, I'm, I'm more likely to want to use their arm after a trauma than a, a rheumatoid patient, for example. And these are unlinked, so there may be benefits to having an unlinked uh, articulation. But of course, we've now introduced a whole new host of complications, including instability, uh, wear of the native joint, and of course, there's less robust evidence available. So traditionally, people have said that on the basis of this, older patients may benefit from total elbow and younger patients should benefit from hemiarthroplasty. Well, I would put it to you that no younger patient is really a good candidate for an arthroplasty. And you should think very, very carefully uh, about doing an arthroplasty, whether it be a total or a hemi in a younger patient. We don't have com current comparative data, but there is a trial in the... Um, in um, Scandinavia, which is going to give us some results. And actually, the best results in my hands and in the literature are for older patients. So don't think that hemiarthroplasty isn't a procedure for older patients. And actually, those are the patients who do best after a hemiarthroplasty. So what are the contraindications to a hemi? Patients with pre-existing arthritis, they're going to go on to have pain. So we want to do a, a total elbow and patients with coronoid fractures, because that's going to contribute to instability of the joint. And it's not really wise to try and fix the coronoid and do a hemiarthroplasty. You're better off doing a linked total elbow. Relative contraindications uh, include the presence of a radial head fracture and an olecranon fracture. But in both situations, a hemi can be performed. And um, revision of failed fixation, such as this case, where there's a poor fixation been performed and then an unstable hemi. And that's because the ligamentous and soft tissue anatomy is distorted. The tissues will be woody, be doing a secondary surgery, and it's much harder to gain primary stability from the joint. So if we want to optimize our outcomes for arthroplasty, we really need to plan these cases properly. We need to um, consider our surgical approaches. We want to optimize implant positioning and soft tissue balancing for both hemi, obviously, but also total elbow replacement. And by doing this, we'll reduce complications that we're worried about, such as loosening, wear, instability, and deep infection. So my preferred surgical approach for all these arthroplasty cases is the lateral paraelecronon approach. This is described by Graham King, and it essentially involves a split in the midline of the triceps proximally, and then bringing the split laterally around the elecronon so that the tenderness attachment to the elecronon of the triceps is left intact. And in doing so, this gives us allows us to perform a, a watertight closure of the joint at the end of the procedure, and we can access the medial part of the joint through a medial window. And this has benefits for range of motion after surgery and also for um, uh, early strength. And I think because it gives us a robust soft tissue closure over the um, implants, probably reduces infection risk. Now, this is uh, even for those people that are used to um, triceps reflecting approaches, I would urge you to try this in the trauma situation because you don't have the condyles in place. It's actually easy to access the ulna through this in a trauma situation, even if you're going to do um, a total elbow. And as you can see, we can bring the, the distal humerus out um, quite easily to instrument and try and you can see the ulna clearly beneath as well. Not only is that approach good for arthroplasty, but if you're wondering about fixation or arthroplasty, you can access the whole distal humerus for fixation. And so in this complex coronal shear type fracture, we've got a much better view of the articular surface to allow a direct reduction and fixation of all those components than we would get through an electron and osteotomy. And if I couldn't stabilize those components, I could then transition straight into either an osteotomy or um, a hemiarthroplasty or total elbow. How do we manage the ulnar nerve? Um, well, th th there's, this is a, a very popular question that I get asked. 
And I think the message, regardless of your uh, management, whether you prefer to transpose or decompress in situ, you must be aware that there's around a 25% incident of post-operative symptoms, but the majority of these will resolve between one and 12 months. My practice is to do a transposition. Uh, anecdotally, that's given me much um, fewer ulnar nerve-related problems post-op. And also, it means that if I have to go back in, for example, after a failed fixation to do an arthroplasty, it means that I don't have to re-explore, re-dissect a scarred ulnar nerve. So it will make the procedure quicker and avoid a second, a second insult to the nerve. When we're choosing implants, there are, uh, these are the four main implants on the market for total elbow. Um, only the latitude... Um, Sorry, only the latitude will provide a hemiarthroplasty. Um, and you need to be aware of which of these implants you choose to, to use and because they all have slightly different uh, polyethylene um, characteristics and design features. My preferred implant is the latitude from um, Stryker now. And this, this is because it allows me to do a linked, an unlinked total elbow and a hemiarthroplasty. So one of the main complications is uh, loosening. And if we're using uh, loosening of the humeral component, these are the factors we can't change. So the shape of the stem, the length of the stem, the stem coating and design features, and whether there's metaphyseal bone support in a fracture. So we can't change these factors, but what we can change is how we um, place the implant in terms of length, rotation and alignment, and how we fixed it using good cementing techniques. So we have to concentrate on these factors to optimize outcome. I'd urge you to use a third generation cementing technique exactly as we've learned from our hip surgeons to retrograde fill, uh, use a restrictor and pressurize to give us the best possible cement mantle. And to do this, you need to use a narrow nozzle with low viscosity cement. Otherwise, we won't be able to get into the canals, particularly on the ulna side. Humeral component rotation is important in both a total elbow, a linked implant, or a, and an unlinked hemiarthroplasty or total elbow. Why? Because in an unlinked implant, if we malrotate the humerus or the uh, uh, humeral component, we're likely to get increased wear of the native bone and instability of the joint. And in a linked implant, if we malrotate, we're going to get polywear and, and loosening because of uh, increased abnormal forces. So the normal axis of rotation of the humerus is through the epicondylar axis. The problem in fractures is that we don't have these fixed landmarks like we do in elective surgery because they're broken uh, away. So we, are, we should use uh, this area, the flat spot of the um, distal humerus on the posterior surface, just proximal to the olecranon fossa. And we know that this um, posterior humeral line is externally rotated to the correct axis of rotation by around 14 degrees. So when we put our implants in, we want to, we want to make sure we don't um, we, we want to make sure we internally rotate relative to this landmark. For instance, if we put the implant in, you can see parallel to the posterior humeral line, we're going to get asymmetric loading of, uh, of the joint. So we want to internally rotate and give us a normal uh, correct orientation. Don't forget about ulnar rotation if you're doing a total elbow. This is the only study looking at proximal ulnar uh, rotational al alignment by Graham King. And again, it's a very old study, a nicely done study, but they concluded that the ulnar rotation was perpendicular to the flat spot of the posterior humerus. Now, the, just note there was a 12 degree swing in um, their findings amongst cadavers, which isn't often noted. And if you're using a um, anatomic implant like the latitude, then you've got to be conscious that the where you put your ulnar component is going to dictate where your how your humeral component uh, tracks. So if you put our um, ulnar component in this position, our humeral component is going to maltrack slightly with the radial head, and this is going to give us uh, a problem with stability and wear. So in actual fact, what you need to do is reference the um, ulnar rotation from the radial head and the axis of the forearm. And we do this by slightly externally rotating and lateralizing our ulnar um, entry point. 
And remember, this is only really applies for anatomic implants, like the latitude, if you're using centrally located implants, like the next cell, then this may not be so relevant. And this is something we're trying to investigate at the moment. What is important, whatever implant you're using, is to be aware of the various angulation of the ulna. So the um, ulna has this proximal ulna um, anatomy that's various. And if you put your stem in the line of the electronon, you're likely to get a, a perforation medially. So we need to uh, offset uh, and we're going to get maltracking. So we need to offset our entry point laterally and aim down the axis of the uh, ulna shaft, not following the ulna, um, the, the um, electronon fossa. Implant height is important. It's going to restore satisfactory range of motion and it's going to reduce our contact pressures if you're uh, performing a hemiarthroplasty, which could lead to cartilage wear. And it's also going to um, reduce the chance of this push pull phenomenon of loosening if you do a total elbow, where uh, tightness of the joint or impingement will actually pull the humeral component loose. And there's two ways of doing this, one using the medial epicondyle and the other using the roof of the electron fossa. Here are three hemiarthroplasties, and um, we want the axis of rotation of the component to be lying at the base of the medial epicondyle, and that's what's key. So on the left side, we've got a slightly short Im uh, implant, slightly long on the right, and perfect in the middle. We can use the roof of the electron on fossa, which is, tends to be intact, even in complex fractures, which you can see here. And we, we implant our stem using this as a guide, so we don't want to see too much of that roof of the fossa, otherwise we know we'll have over lengthened the implant. Now how do we uh, minimize instability? Well, this is important for hemiarthroplasty. It's not really important, as important for total elbows, but there may be a role to um, repairing these ligaments, even in a total elbow and the, and the flex origins to offset the loads that are through the um, articulation. But it's absolutely vital in an unlinked total elbow or in a hemiarthroplasty. So this is our technique for fixing these ligaments and, and the epicondyles. We use a three, um, three, three sets of sutures on each side of the uh, implant, and um, we fix the ligaments through the axis of the implant. We, um, we suture those on one side and fix them to the opposite side, and then we use tension band sutures into the native bone, as well as circlage sutures around the uh, implant and the condyles. And through using this three combination technique, we have very good rates of healing and um, ligament repair. If we have bigger fractures that are extending proximal to the electron fossa, you might consider plating or using threaded K wires that are buried into the cement mantle. And I found this a very nice, quick and reliable way of fixing the uh, condyles. But remember, it's the ligaments that are much more important than the epicondyles. This lady's got perfect reduction of the epicondyles, but she's still got a non-union of the epicondyles to the native shaft and she has excellent function and range of motion. Rehab-wise, we initiate immediate active range of motion. We start a supine overhead program, and we avoid various and valgus talk on the implant, particularly shoulder abduction. And I prefer to educate the patients regarding the, the problems with overuse and wear off the implant and articulation. So we don't put stringent uh, lifting uh, rules on them, but I, I prefer to educate them about this. And I don't use any HO prophylaxis. I rely on early range of motion and stability, and we don't use any bracing. This is our experience with hemiarthroplasty today. We've done 28 patients, um, all with good to excellent outcome, a very low um, uh, visual analog pain score, and the majority of whom have excellent motion and minimal complications, one chronic ulnar nerve and four transient ulnar nerves with no revisions, no instability, but follow-up is fairly um, short-term with a maximum at 68 months. We've also done a study at the moment, which isn't published, where we looked at um, 40 patients, 20 with ORIF and 20 with hemiarthroplasty. The hemis were all done by me and the ORIFs by our trauma surgeons and myself. And we found a, lo uh, a lower 
complication, reoperation rate, and range of motion in the hemiarthroplasty group compared to RF. But something that's really important to note is that when we compared those patients where there was um, uh, where who had satisfactory quality of ORIF done, there was no difference. And those patients who had poor outcomes had a substandard uh, quality of fixation. So future directions, I think we need to revisit how we fix these fractures. I think we can do much better and we concentrate a lot on, on arthroplasty, but we need to revisit how we fix. We need to better define patient selection and, and work out who is the right patient optimize our technique and we need to know which is better between total elbow and hemi through um, high quality studies and then long-term outcomes and surveillance are absolutely vital thank you for listening thanks joydeep that was a, a great talk um as uh, ravi said i'm just conscious about the time but um, just a, a couple of uh, questions so firstly about the approach joydeep so a lot of surgeons i think um, are still used to the transolecranon approach. You know, they like to have a look at the, the back of the humerus when they want to do an ORIF. And uh, from a practical standpoint, one of the issues that always arises is you're never completely sure whether or not you're going to need to do a, a replacement or whether you could probably get away with fixation. You know, that's a recurrent theme, I think you, you'll agree. So if you were to sort of approach a patient in that manner, and um, say you were planning to do something like molecular and osteotomy, what would you suggest uh, if you wanted to go posteriorly rather than your lateral approach, which, you know, it's a perfectly acceptable approach. It works very well, but uh, surgeons may not be that keen to use that. So what are your suggestions in terms of, you want to do a hemi, but, um, you know, you're going to have to take the olecran and off. So, so in a in a younger patient, let's say a patient under sixty, um, I think you're, it's perfectly reasonable to do an osteotomy if that's your practice, or you do fewer of these. Because I really would urge you not to put an arthroplasty in. I'd urge you to give it your best shot through um, the biggest approach. In the older patients, I think the key comes to recognizing which fractures in your hands and in the fracture characteristics are likely to go to arthroplasty. And if you really are unsure about that, I would refer that type of patient on to a center where they're used to making these assessments, fixing as well as replacing these fractures. If you end up in the situation where you do a, um, a fixation of the, sorry, if you do an electron on osteotomy, that, and you have to do an arthroplasty, then you're better off doing a hemiarthroplasty because in the past, people did do, um, I mean, the standard approach to a hemi was an electron and osteotomy. So you can still do that, just fix it very rigidly. Excellent, good, good answer. Uh, and I think you briefly touched upon this issue. Um, very often you go in there, everything is bone dust and um, you have both the, the ligaments on either side with relatively small or largest chunks. And then when you put your prosthesis in for the purposes of a hemi, you find that you have the shaft and then you have the, the prosthesis without too much by way of any ligamentous attachment. And the thing that worries me in those situations is that you don't get, you don't get as much rotational support to, to, the, to the prosthesis. Um, what, what is your practice? Do you try everything possible to try and get those pieces of bone back onto the humerus or do you excise those bones? Because sometimes I've, you know, I just feel that maybe I should have just excised that piece of bone medially because sometimes, you know, the column goes into a non-union and it's always yeah. there for something to, for the patient to fixate on. On the other hand, you know, clearly that's not a ro rotationally stable construct. What, what do you tend to do? So if you're, so it, it's rare that you, they're so dust that you can't um, get stability in the columns. Um, but in the situation, if it was complete trash, or for example, another example is an open fracture yeah. where it's total dust and you have, you prefer to excise those um, fragments that have been devitalized. Then my tactic there um, would be to use a slightly longer stem with a flange and a bone graft to give you rotational support and do a link total elbow replacement. We're, we're just doing some work at the moment on open fractures, we're about to publish it, where linked uh, total elbow 
it may be superior to hemiarthroplasty because again, like we mentioned about the dislocations, these are a different beast. They're a much higher energy trauma. Thanks, Jody. Matt, you uh, got a question? Uh, well, it's just it's just to mention something. So what, one of the factors we see with hemis um, done in some other units uh, uh, is that is the sizing of the uh, the hemiarthroplasty component. So stability as well. You need to make sure you've got a correctly sized implant. So it's absolutely vital that you're choosing as many op using as many techniques as you can to try and make sure you're doing the sizing correctly. So a lot of these implants will have the spools and the trials on the set. So one of those is you can reference it with relation to the native bone that's there, potentially if you're removing it for the hemiarthroplasty. And then the other is to obviously use the ulna and the radial head, just making sure you've got the correct sizing because understuffing or overstuffing can have significant impaction upon function, but also stability. So it's important you, you try and get as close to fit as you can. One other thing I'd like to mention along the same lines is that I'm aware that in the US, there are some surgeons who have used the total elbow component of the of the latitude system as a hemi. And I would urge you not to do that because it, it, it is in no way, the total elbow component is in no way anatomic and you're going to run into problems. It's much smaller. So really... You, if you're going to do a hemiarthroplasty, you must have the correct implants uh, and spools. So to carry that uh, thought forward, Joydeep, you made a very good point. We, we, uh, we did a, a study with the acclaim elbow probably it was a long time ago, probably before we started orthopedics. But one of the things that Ian used to do was we used to undersize the ulna. So you chose your appropriate sized humeral component and you put it in uncemented at the right rotation where you felt, you know, referencing it appropriately. And then the ulna used to be slightly undersized if you could, and you try and do a press fit. And then without cementing it, you circle, uh, you move your elbow into complete flexion and extension. And you found that the ulna component always used to reference itself to the humerus rather than, than the ulna. So, and then we used to use that rotation, used to make a little mark to cement the ulna component rather than letting it sit flat. Because with rheumatoid, particularly when the anatomy is affected, it's really very hard to tell what is what, and you can get the ulnar rotation very wrong. So that's a that's a very very good point. Uh, I don't remember reading Graham King's paper, but that might be something to look at. But that's what we did historically. So thanks for that. So uh, so Jordi, a quick question. I mean, I sometimes see uh, kind of elderly patients with very low supracondylar humerus fracture. It's not uh, no, it's an extra articular, but those are very difficult to fix with you know, not a reliable uh, quality of the bone. And I've seen a couple of mines gone into failure. And do you recommend those patients to undergo hemiarthroplasty as a primary procedure? Yeah, that's a definite um, one to consider an arthroplasty. If you look on the CT and look how much bone stock you have uh, in the capitellum and on the, um, on the medial column, uh, if, if, if it is so low that the bone stock is uh, insufficient for one or two screws, then yes, it's a good indication because in those osteoporotic patients, the problem is you can't get compression um, between the fragments. Uh, so you can fix it, but there'll be no compression and hence there's a chance of the non-union. Great. Okay, so uh, uh, thanks uh, Joydeep again and thanks Sumit for uh, moderating this session. Uh, so we'll move on to the next talk uh, and let's see what uh, Andy has to say to optimize the function of the, the fixation we do, the replacement we do, and uh, how we optimize his outcome. So let me introduce Andy. Andy is uh, again a good friend of mine. He's an upper limb surgeon with a special interest in uh, shoulder and elbow practice at Whitington Hospital. He's trained in Northwest part of the UK, and uh, he's completed his fellowship with uh, Whitington as well as uh, from Florida. Uh, apart from his uh, interest in uh, the, you know, shoulder uh, and elbow arthroplasty and arthroscopy work. Uh, he's keen uh, on research, training, and education. And, uh, you know, he's been involved as a FRCS uh, upper limb courses at Writington over the last few years. So over to Andy. Thanks very much, Ravi. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, and thank you to the Northwest Education Academy for the invitation to speak today, as well as Ortho TV. Um, so I'm really fortunate to be part of a strong Writington family, and you can see that in some of the pictures here on my first slide. Um, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants, and, and at Writington not only 
uh, Sir John Charnley, who founded the orthopedic team, but um, also John Stanley, who you can see in the center of the picture above. Uh, he founded Oracle Immune Unit back in 1979, and um, unfortunately, we, we lost him earlier this year. Uh, his memory, however, and his work live on through the unit uh, and through many of the uh, people in this picture here and, and many of those who are my mentors as well. So, um, uh, concentrating uh, on elbow trauma today. So elbow trauma is common. In fact, 3% of all people who visit the emergency department in the UK come with uh, some form of elbow trauma. The injuries are often uh, simple, common things that can be discharged, but they can also be very complex with a huge variation in the combination of fractures around the bones of the elbow, as well as those unseen ligamentous injuries. And here was quite a novel fracture I've seen very recently with uh, an elbow dislocation with a seemingly intact coronoid fracture uh, it's sorry, intact coronoid, but with an uh, associated olecranon fracture. So we're always seeing sort of novel variations on those injuries. Our understanding of these patterns uh, and the types of injuries we've seen have, have, has really increased over the last uh, 10 to 20 years. Uh, and that's given us good uh, grounding for optimal treatment, stabilization of those injuries, so we can get that early range of movement and prevent that elbow stiffness that we all know is a, is a potential complication. And that's the, one of the most exciting things I think about elbow surgery now. Um, fields are still evolving. You saw some of the uh, literature that Joydeep produced is all relatively recent. Uh, and so we're still uh, finding our feet, finding uh, what the optimal way of treating many of our patients are. The elbow trauma is a significant burden, both acutely, but also more chronically. Uh, as elbow surgeons, a huge proportion of the new patients we see in clinic uh, are people who've had trauma, even in the recent past or, or, or um, several years ago, and are still feeling the effects. Uh, Joy Deep Search showed similar numbers to this, that uh, uh, the amount of primary elbow arthroplasty for fracture in the UK is around 40%. And this number goes up even for further when you add in trauma sequelae. Unfortunately, when we see some of these patients in clinic and we look back to see how they're initially treated, uh, perhaps if you see the x-ray on the screen currently, uh, you'd say many of these have been managed suboptimally. Uh, and, and really we want to sort of bang the drum for how these injuries should be treated initially. So what I propose today to do today is to try and run through a strategy for assessing elbow injuries acutely uh, and to try and to plan the best way of managing the fra these fractures to give you the best outcomes. So UDA is a concept I came across recently. Um, it's a, a, a strategy initially developed in the US for air combat. In fact, it was a fighter pilot in the 1960s called John Boyd who, um, who devolved this strategy. He famously said he could defeat any uh, other uh, pilot in a dogfight in under 40 seconds. Uh, and he quickly flew through the ranks, uh, went up to the Pentagon, in fact, hit, and his OODA loop that you can see on the screen here was instrumental in use for the US forces in the Gulf War. Uh, this OODA loop in, involves uh, observing, or orient, or orientate, we might say, deciding on a plan of action and then acting upon it. And it, it's crossed over from the military uh, into both a business and political strategy, uh, most famously in the UK in the Brexit referendum uh, back in 2016. So I believe we can utilize a loop like this for our decision-making process in the management of complex elbow trauma. I'm gonna run through a host of cases now showing how I kind of use this loop in my practice. Uh, and hopefully there's some points you can take away for your own. So observation, first of all. So I spend a long time uh, assessing the presenting radiographs. It's really common uh, when cases are presented to you, perhaps by fellows or junior registrars, that they'll flip straight to the CT images, flipping past those are presenting x-rays, um, um, and often in my view, the most important, those presented dislocated x-rays, where a lot of the uh, information, important information can be gained. 
So these are some of the things I'm looking at when I'm looking at those presenting x-rays. I'm looking at the direction of dislocation of the elbow, whether the coronoid's been involved, and Matt's talked a bit about the importance of coronary fractures earlier on. I'm assessing what the unseen injury, so what the ligamentous injuries may be, and also looking at the quality of the bone fragments. So let's run through a few cases. So uh, this uh, on the face of it looks like uh, a pretty common fracture dislocation of the elbow. But when you take time to look at these presenting x-rays, you see both on the lateral and the AP that this is more of a straight AP dislocation of the elbow rather than the common posterolateral dislocation that we see the majority of time. We can see here that there's a large fragment anterior to the humerus, and this may be from the radial head, but certainly there is a coronoid fracture we can see here with uh, some loss of coronoid height. So when I run through my questions, I'm looking at the direction of dislocation. I'm considering a straight AP dislocation. I'm pretty sure there's a coronoid fracture. And, and if there's a straight AP fracture, I'm worried that this might extend both from the lateral facet along to the medial facet. Judging by the direction of dislocation, I'm considering the unseen injury. So the ligamentous injuries are going to be at the back. So not necessarily that anterior band of the lateral and ulnar collateral ligament complex, but the posterior band or the posterior capsular ligamentous structures on the lateral side, what we term the Osborne cotral ligament, as well as the posterior bands of the MCL. So these presenting x-rays really do trigger a train of thought to the structures I need to be considering. Here's a different case and clearly the, the patients in plastus, they may have had some form of reduction prior uh, or, or some form of reduction before any x-ray was taken. We can see here, so running through our uh, list again, we can see there's clear radio capitella dissociation. There's a proximal uh, ulnar fracture, but it's unclear whether the coronary is involved. Certainly it looks to me that there's a large chunk of radial head and that may be contributing to why the radial head is dislocated. Uh, and the, the, the area of the radial head sitting in makes me think that the unseen injury is going to involve that lateral and the collateral ligament complex. Uh, and there appears to be a, a reasonable size of bony fragment here, most likely from the radial head. Uh, and a final case here, um, uh, perhaps a more simple olecranon fracture we might view. Um, uh, looking through our questions here, so that the direction of dislocation, so maybe many uh, people viewing might not even consider dislocation or subluxation with olecranon fractures. Certainly throughout my training, I think a lot of these x-rays are poured over about what the orientation of the fracture was in terms of whether it was transverse or a short oblique or very comminuted. And that would make the distinction between whether we needed to uh, plate fixation or whether we could do a tension band. Uh, dislocation or anterior forearm subluxation was something that was never really considered and I'll perhaps show you this case a bit later on to um, talk about that in more detail. Coronary fractures again are unlikely but need to be considered. Uh, ligamentous injuries again so but the bone quality in this case does concern me particularly looking at this AP image uh, on this lateral cortex here. Uh, I'm concerned about uh, whether there's uh, a pathology of the bone going on. Sorry, lateral cortex up here. So if we look at a little bit in more detail at this image, talking about that AP forearm dislocation, uh, what I want to look is if there's any a V sign to this area here between the radio, between the um, uh, trochlear and the greater sigmoid notch or the coronary fragment. I'm also looking whether the fracture is extending into um, a large part of the greater sigmoid notch and if there's any subluxation of the joint. If there is subluxation, the forearm's going to move anteriorly this way and then this, this um, fracture is unstable and definitely requires plate fixation. All right, so we're moving on from observation to orientation. For me, CT scans are crucial to assess the vast majority of fractures I see. And certainly 
almost every case I'm going to operate on, I prefer to have a CT scan to help plan how I'm going to address that. We've talked a little earlier on about the use of MR imaging uh, and our pro forma certainly our hospital is to use it for the vast majority, if not all simple dislocations. We'd also say for those medial facet coronary fractures, those uh, post-remedial rotatory unstable fractures, we want to look at the soft tissues involved important, uh, most importantly there, and an MR image is gonna give you the best information there. On those CT scans, I'm looking at the congruency of the joint, the facets of the coronoid, in coronoid involved, uh, and it also can give us an idea of the ligamentous injuries. Uh, clearly with an MR scan, it will give us a clear, clear picture of that. So let's go back to a couple of our cases. This is in, this initial AP dislocation we looked at. Uh, and if we move on to the CT image of these, the first thing that strikes me is this fragment around the medial epicondyle. So we're looking at uh, an MCL injury, most likely the posterior band, but it could have gone into the anterior band as well. As we come, come around, there's certainly a deficit to the radial head, that sort of uh, superior part, which you can see with that straight AP uh, dislocation. And we can see a, a large coronoid fragment extending both uh, through both facets, through the lateral and the medial facet, but stopping just short of that sublime tubercle. The, clearly this is a fracture that we're going to need to address with a medial approach. Uh, and I personally would treat this with a buttress plate to support that uh, desire for that elbow to sublapse or dislocate anteriorly again. So those are those questions we've run through looking through those images. Going back to that olecranon fracture, talking about that subluxation, that AP instability potential with this olecranon fracture. If we look at the CT images of this patient, we can see that there is subtle instability, that the uh, forearm is subluxing anteriorly. And so regardless of whether that uh, olecranon fracture is transverse in orientation or is not comminuted, as you can see here, it absolutely requires plate fixation because the tension band wire will not give you AP stab stabilization for an olecranon fracture. Uh, and finally, just looking at um, uh, more of a case of simple elbow dislocation here. So uh, this is a lady in her early 40s who had a relatively low energy slip and fall in her back garden. She tells me she felt the elbow dislocated and managed to pull it back in herself. Looking at the images here, the radio capitella joint on the lateral looks slightly unusual, possibly slightly malaligned. And there are those bony fragments on the outer aspect, which um, make me concerned about the degree of ligamentous injury. She uh, complained of instability of the elbow, that she felt things moving out of place when she moved it and only had around a 40 degree arc when I assessed her in clinic. Uh, going on to these MR images of her elbow, uh, the important thing to look at here is, so this is our uh, trochlea with our capitellum over here. We can see the degree of difference here between her radial head and her capitellum showing subluxation of the radio capitella joint. And on, this, on the image on this side, looking at the subluxation here of her trochlea, so this, um, the wider space on the lateral side compared to the medial. We can see there's a soft tissue injury with the ulnar collateral ligament here uh, torn off its origin and the extent of uh, soft tissue destruction on the medial side of the elbow. And this is a, a patient I went on to stabilize surgically. Okay. After we've taken time to observe and orientate the injury, then we need to make some decisions about how we're going to treat it. We've discussed a lot of these things um, following some of the presentations today. Um, so clearly approach is important. Uh, are you going to approach it both laterally and medially or use a posterior universal type approach? Uh, my practice similar to Matt's is for those uh, elbow fracture dislocations with an intact olecranon. We treat those with a lateral and medial approach and treat more of um, the Montezia type variants with a fracture through the olecranon with a posterior uh, universal type approach. Clearly the patient position is affected. So 
where the patient position, position laterally, we can access posteriorly and even laterally the joint, but it's a little more difficult getting medially. Um, but, but supine obviously is more easy for a lateral and medial approach. We've moved away from using tourniquets for the majority of our elbow fractures. We don't feel it affects the field uh, significantly. However, it does affect the patient post-operatively in terms of the tourniquet pain they get. And here's some uh, images uh, taken from uh, the paper from Greg Bain, uh, Matt showed it earlier. Uh, this is our, our preference uh, going laterally through a modified cocker type approach, uh, and measly through that Hotchkiss approach. But, but clearly you want to use an approach that um, is familiar to you. We would have some caution about using the FCU split approach. We have seen a high incidence of ulnar nerve symptoms uh, post-operatively, and that can cause uh, tethering and stiffness to the joints when, it, when, the, when the ulnar nerve becomes tethered between those heads with the post-operative scarring. Between us, we've talked a little bit about the different fixations available, and, and clearly you want to use what you're most familiar with we would regularly um, use some buttress, uh, sorry, we would regularly use some headrest screws for the radial side, uh, moving on to a, a, a replacement if uh, fracture fragments are too, too comminuted. On the, on the coronoid side, we regularly use buttress plates uh, or independent lag screws and headless compression screws if we're uh, addressing a Montezia type coronoid injury. Uh, clearly the ligaments uh, need addressing as well and we can't forget those and and often those are uh, best treated with anchors uh, and some people choose to augment those. Uh, here's a case where I treated with uh, buttress plating and uh, headless compression screws to the radial side. I just want to draw attention to the MCL fixation we achieved here. Often we see anchors in the tip of the medial epicondyle here. We need to remember that the MCL attaches from the anterior inferior surface. You can kind of just about see my drill hole around here from my um, peak anchor, which is therefore not visible on the, on the radiograph. Uh, and, and probably really importantly, if something we've touched around today, certainly Joy Deep touched on it um, with his elbow arthroplasty talk. Um, Part of the decision process is, would the patient potentially benefit from an elbow arthroplasty? Would we better refer on to a surgeon more skilled in this? Uh, and is the fracture pattern complex, something that you've not seen or you're not familiar to deal with, uh, particularly going around the medial side of the elbow? And would that be better passing on to a, a specialist elbow surgeon? Uh, we've made some great strides in the UK on setting up uh, these elbow hubs to sort of strengthen the, the way we treat elmo trauma. Uh, and uh, here's a couple of cases that have been referred to me. The first case with a comminuted uh, fracture involving uh, both the, the capitella side as well as extending into the trochlea, which required arthroplasty solution. But here's another case that was referred on for potential arthroplasty, but actually on discussion with a patient we, we decided to manage it conservatively uh, with a good outcome and union of the fracture. So referral doesn't always equal uh, arthroplasty. It can e equal an uh, open reduction internal fixation or indeed conservative management on discussion with a patient is that arthroplasty option that the referral's for. Um, a couple of cases of caution, I think, um, um, when we're looking at acting, acting doesn't just mean performing the surgery as well. It's that post-operative follow-up. Uh, here's a case we've seen recently in our unit with a patient with a complex Montezia fracture. You can see here that whilst the ulna has been uh, reduced and fixed to, to good length, unfortunately the coronoid uh, and radial head has not been addressed and that's lead, led to the post-operative instability of the elbow. Uh, since then that the ulna is now intact, we can move away from that posterior approach uh, and uh, look to treat the lateral and medial structures, stabilizing both the radial head and the coronoids to retain that elbow stability. Uh, clearly acting early, referring early, allows us that option to get in there uh, and reconstruct those, those fractures. Uh, and, and perhaps to end on um, 
this slightly more or sad case. Um, these are x-rays you may have remember from earlier on with this subluxed radial head. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as I showed you earlier on, this the ulna was fixed in isolation, clearly leaving uh, instability to the elbow. And again, unfortunately, this wasn't acted on upon early. Uh, and five years down the line, this is the patient I've seen in clinic with clear uh, subluxation and degeneration to his elbow joints. So it really is crucial that we try and get these fractures right the first time around. So to finalize, whilst elbow trauma is common, it, uh, it often uh, can be managed conservatively, but, but when complex can have significant sequelae uh, and needs treating appropriately. I would urge you to take time to observe and orientate yourself to pathology uh, preoperatively and more detailed imaging is invariably required. Make a comprehensive plan before addressing these fractures with multiple steps to retain that elbow stability uh, on the table before the patient's uh, woken up from their anaesthetic. Uh, and if these injuries are complex or might require specialist or tertiary intervention, act early and refer them on. Thanks very much. Thanks, Andy. Thank you very much for that uh, holistic approach. And, and I just kind of remember when I was training, and if I, uh, I was observing an x-ray of a uh, trauma patient for too long, the bosses will say, if you observe any longer, the fracture will heal. But I think unknowingly, I was following the UDA principle there. Uh, you know, uh, but it, it just shows that you need to tempt, you know, you need to spend time uh, on a pre-op planning rather than execution and rushing patients to theater, isn't it? And Absolutely, you clearly, yeah. yeah, clearly shown that that it works. And as, as you, I think, you know, as we get more and more senior, we understand that much better. Uh, uh, so, uh, Andy, I think uh, you know uh, you've touched base on the important principles for any trainee or uh, you know uh, upcoming uh, consultants or even senior consultants. Now, in terms of uh, your elbow dislocation, uh, when you've kind of, you know, uh, managed this non-operatively and they come back to you probably, you know, two months, three months down the line uh, with elbow stiffness. Uh, how do you deal with those sort of patients that, you know, they, they, they decided, patient decided for a non-operative treatment, uh, but then now it's gone into stiff elbow because you would rather have a stiff elbow than an unstable elbow, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so stiffness is the, clearly the body's way of giving you that stable elbow that you need. Um, uh, you know, for everyday uh, everyday life, it's re it's probably the result of of instability most of the time. Clearly, HO can be a, another cause, but HO can develop from instability as well. So you want to spend time assessing what the instability that patient's been been experiencing that may have caused that stiffness. So looking back at those presenting radiographs about where the instability is. Um, and that will give you the clue to, um, so you need to address the instability as well as um, the potential causes for the stiffness. Because clearly if you just remove the HO or, or, or release the elbow to uh, regain some range of movement without addressing that instability, then that stiffness is just going to redevelop. And is there any kind of our conventional uh, teaching was, you know, you wait for HO to get mature, you make sure that your inflammatory markers like alkaline phosphatase or ESR to come down, but that trend is changing, isn't it? People are tending to go a bit earlier. So what's your view on that? So, yeah, I think um, you, you need to look at the reasons why HO is developed. So it, is it instability of the, of the joint? Is it a um, fracture dislocation that's been, been mismanaged? Um, I, I, to be honest, the, the number of patients we see with HO tend to be months down the line in my practice rather than, than an acute scenario. So, um, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the process is often matured by the, process, by the point we, that I'm seeing them. So I don't often see, see someone in the sort of first few weeks developing HO. Um, uh, Joy Deeps, I don't know if Joy wants to come in regarding that. Um, but but yeah, I, I think often we, we see that process matured, and um, I think uh, it, it's key to look at why that process is developing rather than um, considering the time scale of of how long it's been. Yeah, uh, you got it. 
just to you, both your questions, Ravi, I totally agree with what Andy was saying. Just with the stiffness thing, the key is trying to understand why they were stiff. And one reason, as Andy exactly said, is that they, were, um, they have residual instability. But don't forget to think about nerve problems. So particularly uh, neurogenic contractures like the ulnar nerve, uh, that can be a component that requires release. But also look at um, them more holistically. Uh, what type of therapy have they had? How um, engaged were they with rehab? And then on the HO point, timing um, really isn't related to maturity. I want to be able to see the HOs either on an X-ray or a CT so that you can then reliably remove the HO. But the patient also has to be so that the soft tissues need to be mature enough and ready enough to tackle another big procedure. And the patient psychologically has to be ready for another big procedure. So those are the three factors I would look at rather than an arbitrary time frame uh, for HO excision. Sure, sure. Uh, again, I think I have a question to probably Matt. Uh, Matt, uh, you've talked about the LCL uh, reconstruction. Do you use a trans suture, a trans osseous uh, re repair or reconstructions in your practice? So it depends, on the qual it depends on the quality of the bone. So some situations I do an anchor repair, but majority of the time I'm concerned about bone quality and I do a, a drill hole technique, a Y-shaped drill hole technique passing a non-absorbable suture material through and the suture material exit at the insertion point of the lateral collateral ligament. Um, I think times where I was doing an anchor uh, repair you're relying on on good bone and majority of the time these bones aren't that good you have an osteoporotic element to it and I find the drill hole technique gives you quite a good bony bridge between your suture materials and you can reattach it back down I think identifying the lateral collateral ligament injury is important and then repairing it and in my hands I think even everyone's hands a drill hole technique would work quite well and you don't need any fancy anchors particularly to our um, Indian colleagues over there yeah, uh, another question here is, uh, I think uh, to all of you, uh, is there any cutoff time uh, where you would decide to repair LCL or reconstruct LCL? How long, you know, you think that, okay, if it's six weeks, then okay, fine, I'll go for reconstruction. If it's four weeks, I'll repair. Um, so yeah, I'm not go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Joey. Um, yeah, I mean, I think... It's sort of six weeks is a kind of vague cutoff for six weeks in my own mind, but um, uh, many of us, probably speaking, have a have the luxury of having all the equipment uh, available, so we can go in with the proviso that we'll attempt to repair, but have the ability to reconstruct uh, intraoperatively if if required. So I appreciate that might be difficult for um, for other surgeons, and and probably if you're uh, you're getting four or six weeks out from injury, you, you may need to consider um, referring to a colleague who has the ability to do both um, interoperatively because you clearly want one operation for the patient that's going to give them the best outcome. Yeah, Ravi, I think it, for me it comes down to tissue quality and uh, some patients will have very woody uh, tissues that have lost their elasticity and unlikely to um, be repairable. And some patients, even much later on, three months, even you'll be able to dissect that tissue carefully and, and shift it to, to repair primarily. And I think that in, the longer it goes on, as Andy said, you should be ready with the correct equipment and uh, for a reconstruction. But I think the advent of internal bracing has really helped to augment these uh, primary repair with the brace that's not a full reconstruction with an allograft, for example. Yeah, and you kind of use uh, uh, kind of far much longest for reconstruction or? Uh, you so, do... so for me, I, I use an, a hamstrings, a gracilis allograft, personally, that's what I do for chronic ones. But really, I'm going more and more towards using a primary repair with an internal brace where it's possible. Yeah. Great. Uh, Sumit, do you have any question? No, I think that was a, a, a great talk, and Andy. They put it all together. It's it's really important that you have a, a very clear algorithm in mind um, so that you don't come unstuck going forward. So all in all, a very, very productive morning, I think, Ravi. Don't you agree? Thanks for setting this up. Yeah, no, I think great talk. I think it's a, such a complex 
to I mean a complex topic isn't it and uh, i think uh, you you tried uh, in fact i shouldn't call you uh, you know you happy tried as solved the problem of terrible tried for us uh, so you know uh, thank you very much for your input and uh, again thanks to uh, author tv for allowing us to host this webinar and uh, you know uh, welcome to see you all again you know we are looking forward to see you all again thank you very much thanks matt thanks andy thanks joydeep thank you thanks have a good day thanks to me again bye 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 Thank you.